Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final webinar in Qualmark's special Ask the Experts webinar series, Achieving Warranty Cost Reduction Goals with Effective Halt Half. This six-part series is designed to provide a comprehensive overview of setting up and running an effective accelerated stress test program for improving product reliability and reducing warranty costs. I am Gail Eckert, Director of Marketing for Qualmart, and I'll be your moderator for today. Tom Peters, Qualmart Center of Excellence Director, has hosted this series to impart key information for performing effective halt and half so that customer accelerated reliability programs can provide maximum impact for meeting business goals. Today, Neil Dortenbaugh, Qualmart COE Senior Application Engineer reviews effective fixturing. Tom, will you get us underway? Sure. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, a quick review of the modules that we've covered so far, the five modules up to now. Uh, the first one, we talked about setting up an effective halt lab. You know, a little bit of logistics of a lab and how to maximize use of the space available. The part two, we talked about the liquid nitrogen infrastructure, talked a bit about uh, the advantages of liquid nitrogen and the piping and tanks and the connections that go along with the piping for LN2. Part three, we talked about the IPC 9592A requirements uh, for power conversion devices, talked about uh, the HALT guidance that IPC uh, provides for testing uh, those, those products. Uh, part four, we talked about effective HAS on a medical device. Uh, that was uh, very informative. We talked about reliability, specification analysis, uh, sorry, life testing, manufacturing HAS, post-market support. And it was very well uh, presented by, by John Hans Hansen. The effective HAS screening we talked about the second part of your reliability program. HALT takes care of the design issues. HAS addresses process variability. And we talked about the importance of HALT before HAS. Talked about the fixturing, conducting a proof of screen to make sure that you have an effective screen and you have a safe screen. And talked about interpreting the results and, and screen maintenance and modifications. Uh, from here now, we'll start part six, talk about uh, warranty cost reductions and halt fixturing. And I'll turn that over to Neil Dortenbaugh at this time to talk about the fixturing side. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, the uh, fixturing that you use in halt is different from what you're used to doing for a typical electrodynamic shaker. Uh, repetitive shock vibration, which is what's used in our systems, is uh, different from what you're used to dealing with. So I'd like to go into first a description of what the vibration system is so that you have a basic understanding of that before we talk about uh, the details of the fixed string. Now we'll contrast uh, the repetitive shock machine to the electrodynamic or ED shakers that most of you are used to. Uh, the electrodynamic shakers are the traditional shakers. They're uh, it's like uh, speaker technology, very carefully controlled, uh, big amplifiers, typically single axis. Um, you know, the more you want to put together and pay for, the more axes you can get. Uh, with a repetitive shock system, it's designed very differently. These are what we are used in Qualmark and other halt type test chambers. Basically, uh, as you'll see in uh, upcoming slides, what we have are actuators or hammers that are striking the bottom of the table in uh, a random uh, patterns, resulting in uh, three axis and three rotation excitation all simultaneously. So we're able to excite the chamber, uh, the product in X, Y, and Z, and the roll, pitch, and yaw axes around. Uh, rotations around those three axes. So uh, if you're familiar with the uh, ED shakers, have used those before, the spectrum's controlled in real time very carefully. 
It's a heavy table, very rigid, and single axis. Here's a breakdown of what a repetitive shock table looks like. It is lighter, and the table is actually flexible. It's intended to move and flex during operation. It has modes that it moves in. So uh, it will uh, change, uh, basically change shape as it's, uh, as it's in operation. It is multi-axis. The whole table sits on springs in the chamber. So those springs, four springs on each corner, uh, allow the table to move in all axes. And here you see an exploded uh, diagram of a framework underneath the table. These are the individual actuators. You can see that they're mounted at different angles. So as each actuator strikes, uh, uh, they impart a force in a different direction on the tabletop. And so the table sees uh, a random series of impacts with a filtering layer here that also shapes the shock pulse that eventually gets to the tabletop here. And the table constructed to give exactly the resonant frequencies that we want it to have. The spectrum on the table then is fixed based on the table design. Uh, it's not controllable in real time. And to give you an idea of the result of what you see between uh, random vibration and a typical repetitive shock machine. Here is the uh, uh, random vibration signal in real time from an ED shaker and uh, doing what we expect to see, staying within a certain limited range. With a repetitive shock machine, we see the impact of the hammer in real time and then the ring down of the table and then another impact of another hammer and ring down again. And you can see that in real time, we're seeing uh, impacts. This is at a relatively low G setting, and we're seeing uh, a peak G of around 80. Uh, it's not unusual to see peak Gs as you get up into very uh, higher GRMS levels of 500 to 1,000 G peaks. Now, the repetitive shock system really is the very best way to do HALT. It was designed specifically to rapidly fatigue products. That's the goal of what we're doing in HALT and HASS. We're not trying to simulate a specific environment or produce a very specific vibration profile. We're trying to do rapid fatigue. The best way to do that is with repetitive shock. With those shocks going into the product, combined with the excitation from the vibrating table, we're able to excite the resonant frequency of all the components, regardless of what that frequency is and regardless of the orientation of that component or that leg on the component. And across a broad range of frequencies, we have excitation in the table up to 10,000 hertz. So you can see that it's a very different purpose with repetitive shock vibration and that's why we use the system we do. Now, it's a different type of shaker and it needs a different type of fixturing. Uh, those of you, you that are familiar with ED shakers know that fixtures tend to be very heavy and very rigid. Uh, the goal is typically to mimic the mounting of the product in normal use. So you use the mounting holes that the product has and orient it as it will be oriented in uh, normal use. And the fixture itself is quite an engineering project. The resonant characteristics and the transmissive characteristics of them are well understood, carefully controlled, and typically you're looking at applications with a frequency range limited to about 2,000 hertz. Um, so the whole idea of the ED fixture is to transmit the vibration with minimum alteration into the product. With a repetitive shock uh, fixture, it's an entirely different purpose, and you need to keep that in mind as you uh, start trying to get, uh, get your fixturing done. Number one, it needs to be light and flexible. Uh, as I mentioned, the table itself flexes. If we put fixturing on it that makes it rigid, it can dampen out some of the vibration characteristics of the table that you want to see. Uh, we need to have it light so that we reduce thermal mass and uh, keep, max, keep our thermal rates of change up. 
So we typically want to use aluminum and not use any steel in the vibration fixture. We don't really uh, care how the product is mounted in normal use when we're doing halt. We want to do the fixturing so that we maximize vibration transmission. So it could be very different from the way it's mounted in normal use. Uh, if that's what's necessary, sometimes we'll use the intended mounting holes, but only if that's what works out best for us. We have just a general understanding of the transmissive characteristics of the fixture. We want to be sure that it's not dampening out or um, having huge, resonant, uh, huge resonances in a particular frequency band. But other than that, we're not too worried about the vibration uh, frequency transfer characteristics. Really what we're trying to do is get maximum vibration and shock transmitted into the product without radically changing the frequency content that's provided from the table. And for those of you who um, have worked with ED fixtures, here's a few pictures. You can see we're talking about massive, uh, rigid fixtures and uh, quite an engineering project in themselves. Here's an example of a typical halt fixture. And as you can see, altogether different. We have uh, bars that are underneath the table. These are aluminum U-channels that are supporting the product up off of the table. And then we have a couple of bars across the top that are clamping down on the fixture. And the, with nuts here to hold the whole thing down to the table tightly with the goal of transferring as much vibration and shock from the table here up into the unit under test here. So uh, this is really a very simple design, and I'll mention as we look at it, um, may or may not be the perfect fixture for testing this particular circuit card. Generally, uh, we will try to do testing with the circuit card out of the assembly entirely and just bolting the fixture down, because in this case, the case of the uh, assembly is a key component of the vibration fixture itself. This bar is holding the case to the table. So we're relying on this case to transmit the vibration into the board under test. It may or may not be doing that well, and that's something that needs to be evaluated as you uh, design a fixture. Uh, the other reason we put the unit up on bars like this, there's two key things. One is to allow the table to flex more underneath it. As I discussed, uh, the table needs to move. And also, we get good air circulation that way. We design the fixture so that we get the best thermal response we can on the product. So to get faster change rates, we want to have air circulating underneath the product as well. Let's talk a little bit about the materials that we'll use when we build a fixture. The extruded aluminum pieces that you saw across the top of uh, the fixture in the last page uh, they can come from, uh, we use a company that uh, brand name is 8020. There's another uh, tip, uh, similar company called ITEM that makes those extruded aluminum pieces. They're very nice because they're easy to use. From an application standpoint, they're flexible. You uh, can build just about any arrangement that you need very quickly. Also, they have a low thermal mass but higher strength because of the way they're built and uh, more surface area, so you get that faster thermal transition. You also can use just aluminum box or U-channel if, uh, if you want to for fixturing. Uh, it tends to take more machining to uh, meet the application that you need, but it is a simple and uh, straightforward way to get your fixturing started. I, uh, I do like to use aluminum U-channel specifically underneath the product when we're spanning the center of the table because the U-channel is more flexible than the extruded aluminum. And especially when you're spanning, if you're forced to span the center of the table, you want to keep the fixturing flexible so the table can uh, move and maintain its resonant modes. So here's an idea of what the uh, extruded fixturing looks like uh, and a profile here. One of the things that's not obvious as you look here is that these uh, pieces here are actually angled in slightly. 
which makes this whole rail like a continuous lock washer because the nut slips through this rail. As you clamp it down, it gets locked in here so it's continuously under tension and it makes it very good for vibration applications. And you can see that there's very, uh, various fastening uh, methods to make constructions. This is just a simple right angle connector shown here. Here's a more complex assembly built up with the fixturing, but uh, they build themselves as the industrial erector set, and that's not a bad description. You can build just about anything you want to out of it, and it is very easily machined. When you need to drill holes in it, uh, it's easy enough to do. Now here are some of the uh, key things to think about as you think about fixturing for this semi-rigid table as we call it. As I said, we have many resonant modes and they tend to be symmetrical about the center. The single largest resonant mode is an oil canning mode where we have the middle of the table moving up and down in opposition to the corners of the table. As you look closer at the, uh, the higher frequency modes, you'll see that Similar locations in similar quadrants will have similar vibration characteristics. So basically, if you keep your fixturing centered in quadrants, you will have similar vibration characteristics. So uh, that's an important piece to keep in mind, whether you're fixturing one, two, or four products. In general, try to center in the quadrants of the table, and then um, you will have uh, consistent and repeatable uh, vibration characteristics. Now the resonant characteristics of that table structure are integral to getting the desired vibration spectrum into your product. If you dampen out the table or change its resonant characteristics dramatically, then you'll change that spectrum. So we want to be sure the fixture doesn't dampen the table, particularly that you avoid dampening the center of the table. And here's an example of a, a quick little experiment I did where we added this two inch thick aluminum block bolted uh, just down, this is a six, six inch by six inch block, so it's hitting four of the holes that are on four inch centers. When we clamped that down to the center of the table, the maximum vibration that we could reach was reduced by one-third. So by killing essentially that big oil can mode, we cut down a lot of the vibration energy out of the table. If you have rigid, a rigid product and you simply bolted it to the middle of the table, you would have a similar effect. So if you keep the product off into the center of quadrants and keep it up on rails so that it doesn't make the table rigid, you reduce this effect. And I uh, did another experiment to evaluate that effect a little more closely. Let's take a look at first uh, a, a non-rigid uh, fixed uh, assembly underneath the product. I simply have it spaced up on a couple of short pieces of U-channel and we'll take the product, put it in here, and bolt it down. And you see we've got pieces across here that are going across the main frame of the product and holding the product down tightly. And then we're actually measuring the product response to see what kind of energy we're getting into the product. Then I repeated the experiment, but this time with more rigid fixturing underneath so that I was dampening out the table more. And here I've got two inch by one inch pieces. Rather than using the U-channel, I'm using the 80-20 extrusions. The two inch wide pieces are more rigid than the uh, uh, one inch wide pieces. So this represents a more rigid understructure to the entire assembly. And once again, measuring at the same point to see what the effect is. And here are the spectrums and the GRMS readings from those differences. Now, it's interesting to note that GRMS stayed almost exactly the same for the same set point, but look at the big differences in the spectrum. When I uh, clamped it down with more rigid fixturing, I saw more peaks up here in the higher frequencies, but I lost energy in these low frequencies. These are the peaks that we saw with the less rigid fixturing. They're gone now. And 
Now this high frequency valley that we saw when we didn't, when we had the looser fixturing uh, is gone with much more high frequency. You see we're going up to 10K in this graph with the rigid fixturing. So we saw a big shift in the frequency response of the product when we use the more fri rigid fri uh, um, uh, fixturing underneath. Now there's another key point to consider when you have a more complex system, not just a board, but uh, uh, perhaps a system with several boards that are built into a structure. You run into a conundrum. Uh, you must be able to exercise the product for functional testing. And normally that can mean that I've got boards, multiple boards plugged into the system so that they're all talking to each other and working together. But that means I have to have them assembled into an upper level system. And now that upper level system becomes the vibration fixture. It's what's transmitting vibration into the device. And if all that is holding a card in is the connection to the motherboard and some card guides, it can make a very poor transfer of vibration into the inner assemblies. Uh, consider this. Here I have a, a card that is being plugged into a chassis. There's a motherboard in the back the whole assembly uh, plugs into. And I'm monitoring here the response of the card as I test it with this assembly fixtured in. So what's being fixtured to the table is the card cage. And the card cage is being relied on to transmit the vibration to the unit under test. So once we're finally done, we have an assembly like this with the single card mounted in there. And on the card itself, with the board in the product, this is the spectrum that I see. And as you can see, once you get up above two kilohertz, there's not much energy being transmitted into that card. Now, we repeat the experiment, but this time, say we figured out a way to do functional testing on this card without plugging it into the uh, unit itself. And here I've got it fixtured by the hold down uh, screws or by the uh, available mounting screws on the four corners and a clamp near the middle, knowing that I have these massive components in the middle, I went ahead and added a fifth clamp here so that I could get better vibration transmission into the system. And saw a spectrum looking like this now with, for the same table set point, a GRMS of 29 Gs. And when you overlay those spectrums, you can see this huge increase in frequencies here uh, when I get the board mounted directly to the table, and especially this stuff down here in the low frequency uh, range where the board itself is resonating, and we're getting a nice response there now. So more energy into the product across a broader frequency range, more likely to find failures quickly. If at all possible, you get your best results by breaking a unit down into subassemblies and boards and testing at that level. If you can't do that because of functional test limitations, then you have to make a compromise and figure out the best way to do it. It's not unusual uh, when you're caught in that uh, conundrum to modify your device so that it is a better vibration fixture. I've had customers that have replaced plastic card guides with steel clamping card guides so that the board gets more vibration transmitted into it when it's in the test. Now, sometimes you've got products that aren't simply boards. You have uh, large, complex, uh, and unusual things to fixture. Now you might have to get a little imaginative. It's one of the more interesting parts of the job, actually. And uh, here you see a, a small uh, sort of mouse-shaped uh, unit under test, uh, mouse as in computer mouse, of course, and there's not really a flat surface on it to get a hold of it, and the boards that were inside of it couldn't be taken out. They had to be uh, kept in this assembly. And it's not completely clear here, but what this is is a pipe clamp that is being used as part of the fixturing with a pipe clamp bolted to the 8020 extrusion and then a piece of extrusion in front and an angled piece in back 
to hold the entire uh, assembly in so it can't slide this way, and we're able to get very good vibration into that unit. And here, you see we're testing a very large system. This is an industrial gas meter. And we were required, here's a close up of what we did across the top of that product so that we had bars across here that are actually putting the pressure down directly onto the product. And then these crossbars pushing, that are actually providing the clamping force down to the table. And uh, it worked very effectively and we were able to find some nice failure modes in this, uh, in the meter assembly here. We also have to consider that sometimes you will need to have thermal or vibration isolation for some components. Uh, and we'll go into some more details on that if you have issues where certain devices or areas of your product can't tolerate thermal extremes, but you want to test the rest of the product to those extremes. Now here's an example of a fixturing for a laptop and here's the motherboard for it, and you can see we're completely removed from the plastics and have a fairly complex structure built up here that's either bolting into or clamping to the board in several places to get a good grip on the board so that we're exciting it well. And here's air being ducted to come in underneath. And then here we have the fixture, which we wanted to have isolated from the vibration uh, had to be close to the unit under test simply because the cable is very short that goes between the monitor and the motherboard. So we put it up on a bridge and this edge of this support is on this rail that runs along the edge of the chamber that is not on the vibration table. So we have this bridge and the same thing happening on this side. So we have a platform here isolated from vibration we have the fixture supported on that, or the uh, display supported on that fixture at an angle so that it can be easily seen. Uh, the main reason it's here is because we need to be able to see what's happening on that screen in order to do the functional test on the product. So it's positioned so it can be seen from the window. And then here's all the cabling. The hard drive has been taken out and is sitting outside the chamber. Uh, and we have external keyboard and mouse outside. And here's a, a close-up of the reason we had to go to all this trouble. Here's the cable that uh, we had to deal with for video. Though we had to leave enough slack in that because the vibration table, of course, will be moving. There's some excursion in that table. And left us fairly limited in how far away we could have the display. Now, the other problem with the display is if you get it hot, you can't see it. It goes black. That's a characteristic of these displays and we need to be able to see the display. So we have also thermally isolated the display. And you can see here, what we've done is put it in a plastic bag, sealed the bag shut, and this is a tube that's bringing in compressed air from the house compressed air source that's at ambient temperature. And this bag is continuously inflated with that room temperature compressed air. And over here somewhere is a hole to allow that air to escape. So we are bathing the display continuously in room temperature compressed air. And that is sufficient to maintain a temperature that will allow us to see the display while we ramp the product, the board underneath, up to the thermal extremes that we want to see. Now, one of the challenges that was faced with the laptop is that the display has very different thermal and vibration ranges that it will operate over versus the motherboard. So we'll want to test the motherboard and the display separately. In this test, obviously, we're getting the motherboard tested and we have the display isolated but in the chamber. Now, in this case, we're showing the motherboard being isolated and the display is what's under test. So now the motherboard is inside this insulated box. And here you see the box with the lid on the top. And you can just see wires here that are showing that the entire box is suspended from the ceiling. So it is not seeing the vibration. It's sealed. And there is a tube here that's bringing in ambient compressed air to keep this entire box cool. 
So now we have a system that is being isolated thermally and vibrationally, and the display, which again is right here with the cable going out to the display, that short cable, uh, the display is now seeing the thermal and vibration extremes of the chamber. So we can test it separately. And mother, uh, disk drive and et cetera, all still being mounted outside of the chamber. So they're not part of the test. So here's the few key things to keep in mind when you're designing fixturing for your system. The key goals, keep it simple, as simple as you can. Maximizing transmission is what is important. And maximizing the bandwidth. Don't design a, a something that will minimize or uh, reduce the bandwidth that the device is seeing. Don't dampen your table. Let it provide all the energy that it can. And don't try to match the in-house, uh, the in-use mounting conditions. If the existing mounting holes don't suit your needs or aren't sufficient, uh, don't use them. Figure out another way to clamp it down. The, the goal is to keep the, uh, keep the transmission up. And then uh, another key item to keep in mind as a bullet point is monitor the vibration on the product. You're primarily interested in the product response, not what the table is producing. So if you have the table running at 45 Gs, it doesn't mean anything if you realize with an accelerometer on your product that it's only getting to 10 Gs because of internal uh, physical isolation. Keep an eye on, your, on the uh, actual components uh, that you're interested in, the boards and internal assemblies in your product. So that concludes what we wanted to talk to you today about halt fixturing. And now we want to talk some about HAS fixturing and the details of that. It's an, um, not really details. Uh, it will give you an overview of it simply because HAS fixturing is a more complex and there's many more things to consider as you move into HAS. In HALT, we really have it pretty easy. Uh, we can design a fixture that's guaranteed to work for one test and that can be reproduced with uh, reasonable accuracy, but as long as we know the response on the product, we can adjust inputs to, so that the product responds the same in later tests. In HAS, you've got a, set of a whole different set of criteria to uh, be concerned with. Typically, you've got a whole bunch of units in the chamber in HAS. You've got it as full as you can, get, you can get it. So if we have slots, say, for boards, we have to have similar excitation slot to slot so that we don't uh, have unequal excitation. And it must be consistent across all locations on the table. If you've built a test fixture that fits on a quadrant, then as you move that test fixture from quadrant to quadrant, you want to see the same vibration and thermal response. And of course, from test to test. When you insert a card and fixture it in, you want to be able to do it very quickly and easily and see the same vibration as the system wears or uh, as operators make slight differences in how they uh, put things together. You need to have that consistency. And you have to realize it needs to be durable. Um, HAS environment is designed to fatigue mechanical assemblies. Uh, that's what a HAS, uh, HAS fixture is. So you need to understand uh, what you need to do for PM intervals and uh, make the entire system as durable as you can. Keep in mind now we're in production. It needs to be easy to load and unload and you need to be able to do it quickly, as foolproof as it can be. Reduce or eliminate manual clamping or uh, uh, using nuts to clamp something down. You need to have it automatic and carefully controlled. And now, you need to worry about protecting the product under test. I don't worry about scratching something in halt, but if you've got a HAS fixture that scratches a product, you're in, you're in trouble. So we need to be able to get products into the fixture, tested, and out of the fixture 
without scratching or damaging them and uh, do it very quickly and easily. So he, these are some of the many things that need to be considered as you get into house fixture design. Number one are the thermal specs. Actually, uh, it can make life a little easier in Hass because we're typically running over a, a lower temperature extreme that can uh, free you up to use things like Delrin for portions of your fixture or even nylon, depending on the ranges you have. So you have uh, materials that are uh, easier to machine to work with. And um, the, you have to be sure that you're getting the ramp rates that you need once you get a chamber completely full of product, you can interfere with the airflow of the chamber quite a bit. So you need to pay attention to that with the Haas fixture, and you may wind up uh, designing custom plenums so that you keep the ramp rates and the airflow where you want them. Human factors are key. Uh, you have repetitive motion things to think about and heavy lifts. You want to be sure you don't have sharp edges or ways that a person can injure themselves while they're putting together the system. And the vibration specs, as we've discussed, uh, variations uh, uh, from place to place. And also realize that the products you're testing will have some variance in dimensions. There's specifications on the size of a case on a power supply, for example. And as a smaller supply gets clamped into a fixture, will it see the same vibration excitation as one on the, the higher side of the spec? And now you have a lot of connections and uh, functional test requirements to worry about that all have to be worked in. Cable handling can become a big issue. And the cables and connections also become wear items that are of concern. Now, as we go into the process of designing a Hass fixture, here's an idea of the basic, uh, the basic process that has to be gone through. And this whole process is part of what Qualmark's Center of Excellence team can uh, guide you through as you go from specification all the way through to validation and verification. And here's a picture of a Hass power supply uh, for power supplies, we have a bar across the top that's being clamped down across these five supplies. This is a unit that can be bolted into the center of a quadrant. We have consistent clamping pressures. It's easy to load and unload. You can get lots of units in per square foot of table space. And that's your goal in Hass fixturing. And at this point, that concludes the key items we wanted to bring to you. And now, if there are questions that are coming along, um, Tom? Yeah, there's one here that talks about the ducting of the air. Uh, the ducts are four inch, and he has a product with a one inch port on it. And how do you connect a four inch duct to a one inch port, and how does that affect the chamber cooling? Oh, in, in general, if you have a, a fan or a some other device on your product is designed to bring air into the product in a specific way. We don't um, specifically try to aim air into that duct. Uh, ideally, we're taking the cover off the unit, so the fan or the duct is meaningless anyway. If you need the cover on the unit and there is a hole to get air in, it's fairly straightforward to aim a single duct towards that hole and We've got lots of high-speed airflow there. We're going to be able to get air into the unit without significantly affecting what the rest of the, what's happening in the rest of the chamber. We can direct a small portion of the air into that opening and uh, get good change rates without affecting things. And then we have another question on fixturing. Uh, they have a fixture that goes transverse over the two quadrants. And would it be better if we reorient the fixture to go longitudinally? and direct in line with the open doors. So if we've got a, a product that's uh, rectangular and so large that it spans across quadrants, as I mentioned, you, you want to avoid dampening the center of the table. Similarly, if possible, you want to avoid dampening 
the uh, four lines that define the quadrants. So those center lines uh, are uh, higher frequency modes. If you're forced to go across those, it won't have quite as much effect. That's what it sounds like with this product. We're going across two quadrants, and the question is, do I do go across the two quadrants that I see when I look in the door, or do I go across the two quadrants that go across in the front of the chamber? Um, it won't make a huge difference from a vibration standpoint, which way you do it, but from a thermal standpoint, you'd be better off uh, crossing, uh, basically having the long axis of your product in the x-axis on the table. And at Qualmark, we've defined the x-axis as the axis through the doors, uh, only because then you'll have more thermal uniformity across the product. Uh, the, the air moves uh, in the y direction in the chamber. So if you orient your product so that it's parallel to the front of the chamber, you'll have slightly better airflow. Now, on the bars that go underneath, would it be better to have one long bar or section those bars across the quadrants? Yeah, then, then sectioning the bars makes more sense. And that is, don't have a single rigid piece that goes clear across the, those pairs of quadrants. Uh, then that'll let the table move more. Have, uh, as long as it's up off the table and you've got good support and transmission into the product, you can leave the middle third of it without a bar underneath it, and that lets the table move a little bit more so you get more transmission into it. So here's a question for you, Neil. Um, why do I need a spectrum analyzer to measure fixture effectiveness? Why can't I just use the chamber's auxiliary vibration input to measure GRMS values? Um, yeah, the GRMS values are, it's, it can be a useful metric, but it tells you nothing about the spectrum that you're seeing. It gives you just a kind of a gross overview of how much energy is getting into the product. And knowing that the fixture can affect the spectrum of the, uh, of what's getting into the product and you want to have broad spectrum excitation, the only way to make sure that's happening is to do a spectrum analysis and see really what's happening at all frequencies. Just looking at GRMS doesn't tell you if the fixture design is clamping, is cutting out a, a section of frequencies that you need for an effective test. <coughs> Um, another one is, the question is, can I use wood 2x4s for fixturing? Uh, I've seen it done, and it always sort of gives me chills, uh, only because if you think about it from a vibration standpoint, the absorptive characteristics of wood would be such that a lot of the high frequency vibration would get dampened out. And there's inconsistencies uh, involved there as well. It's tempting to use that, but um, yeah, talk about easy machining, but it's not advised at all. And it falls into the same category as not using steel. Um, you know, Unistrut is something that a lot of people, you look at it and then you say, this looks handy and flexible, I should be able to use this. Well, flexible in function perhaps, but not flexible in terms of table motion. It will very much make the table rigid and uh, reduce the vibration transmission. So stick to aluminum as a material to use. Uh, it gives you really the best characteristics. Okay. Another question, I have an OVTT system which only has four hammers. I see higher G levels on the corners of the tables compared to the center of the edges. Is that a concern? Um, yeah, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the OVTT is our uh, tabletop vibration system. It's not a combined thermal vibe, it's just a table. And it's a smaller table, it's a 18-inch um, by 18-inch table in this case. And it does have just four hammers driving it. And it's not unusual if you, if you get down and look at what's happening inch by inch on any of the tables, you'll see variations from section to section. Once you get your product fixtured, one of the effects of that fixturing is to basically integrate the vibration excitation from that entire area into your product. So if one portion 
is more active than another portion of the table, it doesn't really affect your test unless your product is so small and being fixtured so locally that the entire excitation on the product is different from position to position. And then that's only a problem if you're trying to mount many units in and see the same excitation on all the units. So uh, it's not really a concern. What you really want to look at is how your product is responding when it's fixtured and if it responds differently at different points on the table, then do all your testing at the same point on the table and monitor product response. And you did bring up a good point, Neil, in the fact that if you're testing multiple products as you would in Haas, part of your fixture qualification is to make sure you're getting consistent response across all locations in the table, and that's part of the fixture design process. Right. And it's based on the response of the product, not on the response of the fixture. Other question is, should the fixture be representative of the end use mounting of the product in its end use environment? Oh yeah, I think we hit that a few times in there, but in general, the fixturing should be designed to be the best possible fixture. And, if, and with no concern about whether or not I'm duplicating an end use mounting condition or an end use environment. And that's one that you know, people say, but gee, I, if there's a resonance in the system that's going to be a problem, I might not find it. Well, the testing that we're doing in HALT is not intended to replace the vibration testing that you would do to confirm the vibration characteristics of your device. They're designed to fatigue and break weak links quickly. And so we're going to show you the weakest parts of the product and what's going to break first by fixturing the very best way to achieve that goal. And uh, it's one of the surprising things, I guess, that we ignore in HALT is intended use conditions. We're designing a test to rapidly fatigue and show you failure modes. When you're mounting a system in the chamber and using the chassis, is it a good idea to take the rubber feet off the bottom or the mountings off the bottom of the chassis? Oh, as a general rule, yeah. If you're putting a product up on rails, the feet aren't on the table, more than likely, but they can get in the way and be a problem when you're trying to situate the product so that you can hit the bolt holes in the table. So as a general rule, I take those off um, just to keep them out of the way. And you don't want to have the product bolted down straight to the table. As I said, you want to have it up on those rails. Okay, and Neil, I believe you touched on this. Um, someone wants to know why can't they use their halt fixture for Hass, or can they use their halt fixture for Hass? Yeah, um, I guess typically no, because the halt fixture isn't designed to meet all those unique requirements of the Hass fixture. The, uh, primarily being with the Hass fixture, you're putting as many units into the table into the unit into the chamber uh, as you can and uh, you will need to have consistency across there and a halt fixture usually doesn't meet those requirements you don't spend the time <coughs> to design a halt fixture that would do pass well so in rare cases yes but uh, want to design a fixture that meets the goals Okay, great, thank you. And thanks everyone for your questions and for attending today. I've placed links to the recording in this series on our home page at qualmark.com. Look under the spotlight section. I'd like to thank the Qualmark COE team for hosting this special Ask the Experts series and for sharing their knowledge about HALT and HAS can be so effective at helping companies reduce their warranty costs. Qualmark Center of Excellence was established as a central source repository for our customer and partners where our 20 years of knowledge can be focused on delivering effective product reliability solutions. I invite you to send an email to the team at excellence 
at qualmart.com to start a dialogue about how Qualmart can help you reduce your warranty costs and improve product reliability. I also invite you to visit our online library at qualmart.com where you will find helpful documentation about HALT and HAS testing as well as information about Qualmart products and services. Thanks again everyone for attending. We'll see you next